Van Berlin, when we started the, the crepe group down here. And I can speak to you. I, I fought a lot with Van Berlin, I, but I learned a lot from him. He was a very generous human being. Um, but he was generous in the, in the sense of he knew it. <laughs> well, somebody like Brian Winter remained a very generous human being and anonymous. Yes. John Wells, uh, a most intense person. And I think probably of all of them, uh, somebody slightly older than myself, um, of extreme value because um, he had the incisiveness of Nicholson, but at the same time he had the sort of generosity of a gabbo. This is John Wells. This is John Wells. I, I think a, a very big person. And also Guido Morris, the printer, who um, I found a peculiarly weak person in many ways, very strong in others. So really my interest was, was in people, very much more than in ideas. While well, Nicholson's tendency always has been towards ideas. Yes. My final break with Nicholson was due to his imposition of ideas on a community, on a society, which yeah. I couldn't stand. Thank you, John. And uh, what about your roots and Cornwall and the kind of landscape and so on, which you keep harking back to? Now, how, how important was this particular structural landscape to you when you developed into a mature painter, sort of from 47 onwards? Well, I think very curiously, um, this country here and its, its stone and its oldness were actually my own bones. Um, <laughs> this may seem something no, very remote. It's quite understandable. But um, I felt that I had to have bones, as it were. I couldn't accept the skeleton and the flesh put on top of it, or the antique. Uh, but I knew that I had to have this thing. And all the way through the war, this, I had a feeling uh, for this particular country, this strength. And uh, it held me up many times, as one does in the war, and held up by odd things. Yeah. In fact, I used to do a funny thing. I used to think to myself, now, let me see. That piano that I used to play, the bass was in the west, and the treble was in the east. I used to think, now, that's the, that's the east and that's the west. And that's where that piano would be. Funny thing, isn't it? A sort of physical feeling yeah. of how I was related to this place, which was well away, because one always thought of home, I suppose, in the war. But um, when I came back, um, it used to be, in fact, this, this thing of, I was interested in what happened between just outside St. Ives, a place called Hellesbeen, and uh, St. Just. And this was going west, and the other way going east. And that bit of country was actually my bones. I found, when I came back from the war, that it had much more to it. It had the, a lot of depth underneath it. I really began to realize that I came out of a family which was concerned with mining. I visited mines, went down them, I used to climb down the cliffs and get into old edits and so on like that. And um, I think probably my own myth was built up over this thing of uh, miners working under the ground, under the sea, coming up to the surface and fishing and so on. It's extraordinary commerce which went on in this small strip of land Nothing very much went on in the south. It was always on this north part, which is full of minerals. And in addition to this, the surface thing of weather and the sea against the rocks, the sea against the shore. Um, eventually, of course, I was able to associate it with male and female. And this became a central, very much central thing as I was married and had a family then. And um, I got my idea of how painting was something surfacing, like a man's face, with very old and deep roots coming up, as it were, through my feet and my own bones, and then uh, physically interpreting it back into painting. But I couldn't do it by a, a, a direct representation of a single viewpoint. I mean, I, in fact, I couldn't see my country from outside. I'd seen these other places I'd been to in the war from outside, but not always, because usually when I was looking at something, something happened. You got shot up, or you got bombed, or something like that. But I had had an intensity for the war, say, street fighting, or or being under fire, uh, which made me find strength in myself. And this strength, I think, was the same as the granite strength of my own country, which I think may answer that question. It goes a long way off it, comes back. No, no, it does. Yeah, yes. Yeah, very good. Uh, but do you think, then, that this kind of landscape for your art is a kind of projection of yourself into the surrounding country, that you're kind of integrally tied up with it, that it's like painting a kind of self-portrait every time you paint the landscape. Uh, yes, I think so. I would say with certain reservations, and yet I'm not sure that I can describe them because they're so personal. 
Um, I mean, do you, do you think of this in a rational kind of way or in an emotional kind no, of way? No, in an emotional way. Emotional, yes, yes. I see. I don't think of it in a rational way. I would rationalize it to try and explain it. Yeah, but you'd have to. Um, you see, I think my identification with this country is not to say that um, the fields go off into, into the distance and they stop at the edge of a hill or something like that. I'm much more interested in the fact that uh, perhaps this hedge that I'm walking along uh, many other people's shoulders of generations have actually um, they've actually touched this, these hedges. They're, made, they're man-made and they have a physical proportion to man. Yeah. I know that some of them are, are the sort of size that one man could plow with, plow with one horse in one day. Um, it's this sort of relationship to man himself. The, uh, the shame that I feel, for instance, when going along the coast and seeing these ruined tin mines, it really is the most um, intense shame that these ruins are a monument to um, a social system which is absolutely criminal. The men should have worked as tributaries. They should have gone down and perhaps for years not found any tin. And when, when they had this great joy that they had of, of getting riches, which took Cornishmen all over the world, went into gold rushes and so on, that the, the mine owners should have not been concerned with the welfare of the men to push their loads right, left and center into the sea and so on. Uh, and that a mine, for instance, could have shilling shares which are worth a hundred pounds in five years, while the maintenance of, 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 a, of the mining machinery could be so vicious and wicked that the men would be killed by its, by its pure rusting out or its, its pure bad engineering. I mean, this, this has been... Um, you can't escape it. If you walk along this coast, you can't escape this shame. It's rationalized now by socialism and other isms and so on, but it isn't really rationalized. Um, there's a great... Uh, pressure of human suffering which has gone on. And St. Just itself, for instance, is like a town waiting. Something terrible happened. Two really terrible accidents which stopped the town in its tracks. These are something that I feel very deeply. In, in, I mean, in the human history of the country. I see. Do you feel you can kind of express these uh, emotional reactions to the place in any way in your art? I mean, does it come well, out at all? Very rarely. I think they're so complex. Um, I think between 1949 and 54, um, I definitely did express them in some paintings like the Julian Farms, and particularly the St. Just, where I used the um, a mine as a crucifixion. Yes. Um, later, I think I'd be much more concerned with um, different sort of things, which certainly involve these things. I think that probably the shapes and forms I used um, have a certain sort of maybe anger at these things. Um, they may be distorted by uh, uh, certainly my bitterness about them. But oddly enough, I'm uh, I'm being concerned with other things now. I'm being concerned with, for instance, the pathos of uh, of being up in the air and remote from all this stupendous um, pressure of of mining and farming and so on that's going on down below. I think that I'm able now to detach myself farther from it, but the anger is still there. This is associated with the gliding, is it? It's associated with the gliding, yes. yes, yes I see. I'm talking about today. Yeah. Much more. I mean, I've always been concerned with painting weather. Yeah. I can't rationalize what the weather does to me. Um, I don't know what it is. It probably creates a sort of excitement in me, which will allow me to paint things. And very often images come through which I don't recognize for years after they're painted. I didn't recognize the image in the St. Just thing for a long time until uh, John Berger wrote about it. This man is well aware of the social problems. It's not the whole image of the painting, naturally, because a painting exists in its own curious way, which would infect other people. I don't think my painting is socialist. No, no, no. <laughs> That's no, sense. Mm. Um, I'm interested that, for instance, you have, at various times, done figurative drawings of nudes, for instance. To the best of my knowledge, you haven't ever painted nudes, but perhaps you well, have. I have. Have you? Yes. Uh, well, the four paintings of nudes that I have painted, they're big paintings, are all in one American collection. There's a collector who does collect them. So they're very difficult to get reproductions of in England. Um, I did paint a nude of the Europa myth. Yes. That's the thing that's fascinated me, this relationship of the animal to the human. Um, the story of the Minotaur and so on. Again, this myth thing, which has always fascinated me, probably from living in an old country. 
Um, I have actually painted three nudes of a specific person. I see. Um, but my nudes are much more concerned with nakedness rather more than nude. Mm -hmm. Now, the drawings I do, I think are concerned probably with, um, with nakedness, certainly, but also with sexuality. Um, I think there's a certain sort of um, beauty in the nude woman, uh, which I want to try and get in these drawings. Uh, when they go through the longer process of painting, they very often say the woman might become a mountain or, or <laughs> uh, something as remote as that. Or eventually I might be able to produce nakedness, perhaps as um, the sensation of oneself against impossible weather. This, but in, in, in the drawings I draw directly from the nude, and it is actually this, um, this sort of happening between myself and the nude woman, which is not actually active sexuality, but is um, a, a sort of curtain that comes down between oneself and that model, by which certain sort of uh, human attributes of the female come through. So my, my new drawings are not um, abstracted very far from an actual direct drawing. Yes, I see. And the more abstract painting I do, and not a really abstract, the more painting I do, um, curiously enough, the more precise I find I can be in the drawing of the actual object. And I do draw, in fact, in, in landscape sometimes, M mainly for information. And the same with these new drawings. It is for information about certain sensuous qualities that I'm after. So what's the relation in your work between your drawings and your paintings? I mean, do you work actively from one to the other? Do you usually conceive the image uh, in drawings first and then work afterwards? Or what is your general kind um, of... No, I, I, I think that um, the interest starts. I, don't know, I never know where it starts, actually. But I get interested in something. And this interest may lead me to being interested in, in a female. Um, I may get extremely fond of this person. Um, and by drawing this female, I may help myself to release certain um, formal possibilities. For instance, a drawing of um, a female from the head looking away to the feet which led to quite a number of paintings which seemed to be inverted, where um, it was hanging, as it were, from the top downwards. Uh, other longer drawings of females, where there would be a stretch right across a thigh and a leg, which would lead to paintings of very long landscapes, where I would stretch myself. Having experienced this, um, this long line, say, from the, the armpit down over the, uh, um, the rib cage, down to the pelvis, across the long thigh and down to the feet. Um, that line might take me out in the car to the landscape. And I might experience this again. But by having drawn this nude, I would experience it sensuously. Um, the sort of experience one would have perhaps by some sexual contact with the female. But in this case, uh, transformed to um, an understanding of the landscape. The nearest thing to this, of course, is Henry Moore. Would you describe this as a kind of metamorphosis between one and the other? I guess. Yes, certainly. Between the figure and the landscape? Yes. A kind of interaction of yes. the two? Because actually what happens is it, my own physical um, reaction to the landscape would be this, that having walked a mile or two along the coast, the whole of my side, from my feet, right up to my shoulder and the side of my head and my hair, uh, will be infected, as it were, by sea on that side, and I very often paint that on that side. I mean, I intend that my painting should be physically understood. Now, my um, regeneration, say, of physical understanding would be in relation to the opposite sex. And so um, I couldn't get it perhaps continuously by walking over the country because I might be diverted into many other things, um, into ideas and things which would come from all directions, but I'd concentrate just on the female. Um, will give me that centralizing thing, which is the sexual experience, um, <clears throat> and allow me to um, understand it simply in its simplest form. So these drawings, you see, are, are really this um, understanding of this direct experience of somebody in front of me, as it were. But the actual um, physical connection with this person would be through a painting of landscape. I see. Naturally, there's a <clears throat> in the drawings there's a certain eroticism which remains in the drawings. 
But in the paintings, very often, this eroticism is transformed into something else. Into something more universal. Yes, quite. Not so particular. Yeah. 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 Yes, I guess. Yes. And um, I'd like to know what influence other painters, for instance, long past painters, painters of the Renaissance, pre-Renaissance, primitive art have had on you, generally. I mean, not so much when you were an art student and in your youth, as more recently. Oh, an immense influence, say, of, of uh, Russian icons. I see. This marvelous sort of frontal um, insistence that they have. Uh, Piero Francesco particularly, where all his shapes, all his actions, seem to be the beginning or the end of an action. Uh, they are shapes which are turned out and look at you. And particularly, and again, due to Agent Stokes, um, the most fascinating picture I know, the Tempesta by Giorgione, which is the most open, uh, flattened out, looking at your picture that you can ever imagine. But it's full of mystery. One can never tell, I can never write about it, it never comes out. Uh, there's an endless mystery and, and a whole history of that civilization in this one picture, which looks out at you. This is a quality which uh, fascinates me, the same as Cezanne. Some things are so open and, and, and there that I'm fascinated by them. It's only much later now, in the last 10 years, that I've been interested in Goya and um, Rembrandt. And how do you feel about Rembrandt, particularly? Um, the odd thing about Rembrandt is that there's nothing between me um, and the subject. The painting doesn't interfere, and yet at the same time it does. I can sense this terrific area, probably, of, of paint which was drawn across somewhere and then restricted again to make a nose. Um, this is, to me, Rembrandt is, is, is a sort of intense, deep, human thing of, of, of courage. Um, I'm moved by Rembrandt both as a painter and as uh, a human event. And exactly the same with Goya. I mean, it's not quite the same moving movement because in Goya I'm terrified. In Rembrandt, it's more revealed, it's more uh, there, you know? It's more finalized. Any particular aspects of Rembrandt move you more than others? What about yes. the etchings, for instance, and the graphic work? The etchings do move me a lot, but the things that really move me are his self-portraits. And the late ones, more particularly? The late ones, more particularly, ones. and particularly the most wonderful painting in the National Gallery, the, the Philosopher. Yes. Which, to me, is an extraordinary mystery. I mean, this, this has all the etchings, it has all that sort of concentrated light. Actually, it's quite an early work, too, yes, isn't it? Yeah. And I love, I, I mean, I, <laughs> I love Saskia, Flora. Uh, this is a sort of, um, it's not pathetic, it's not humorous. It's qualities which one, one can't touch. But it's to do with subject, you see. It's, um, it's not, say, now, what painter can I think of um, where I'm seduced by the paint? I'm not seduced by the paint, but I ran around. Be a soutine. Hmm. I'm taken into the paint, into the actual making of the paint, and um, removed perhaps some two children running across a field, right up into a most marvellous sky, which is sort of um, a glory, you know? While in Rembrandt I'm looking at an act, some act, great tableau, which has been established, and I, I feel an immense human, an epic quality, which I don't feel, for instance, in, in, in a soutine. What about the actual bones of a Rembrandt? Yeah. Like, for instance, the, the abstract qualities of light that you get in a thing like the Philosopher. Does that well, interest that's you from an abstract point of view? That's what really fascinates me in the Philosopher, yes. Yes. I find an extraordinary... It almost is an abstract painting. Yes, it is, isn't it? Yeah. But at the same time, I feel an extraordinary... Um, there's a, an extraordinary controlled rate in which that light moves across the picture. It's on a diagonal as well. When this interests me... Uh, say, about geometry and, and the way that diagonals turn and so on. All these purely technical things interest me, but um, it has a sort of poetry about it, a quietness and stillness and finality, which I'd love to get in my own painting, and I very rarely do. Occasionally I can sense it, perhaps in some corner or other, but normally my painting is so involved in something which is going on at the time that, perhaps because of the time we live in, it's very difficult to finalize anything. You say you're moved by the kind of humanism of Rembrandt. What about the, well, what people might call the spiritual kind of uh, reality that comes over in his crucifixions and religious subjects? Does that kind yes, of, well, you, in, in a similar manner, does the metaphysical kind of reality of Rembrandt touch you? Oh, yes, I think it does. Um, I think his story, in human terms, of... Um, 
the sort of trial of Christ is marvellous. You know, I can, uh, through Rembrandt, I can feel that if I'm walking down a lane, I have Christ with me. This would be understandable through Rembrandt. It would be understandable, too, through, uh, curiously enough, through, through uh, um, Bruegel, you know. But Rembrandt is much more direct. I think it's, a, it's an affirmation of um, the power of, of man to be both spiritual and carnal. It's very strong to be this. What about this little picture in the National Gallery of the woman taken in adultery? This great temple behind her. Does that kind of move you on, on this level? Well, it's very odd, this picture. Never, never has moved me. I don't know why. I think it may be formally, in some way. It's, <laughs> it's remote. Yes, I see. You know, I think probably one goes to certain pictures that have a, have a formal quality, and yet I can't understand why it should be. Mm. It may happen to me later. You know, I think about Rembrandt, that it does actually happen to people much later on. Mm. I think they grow into Rembrandt, and they grow out of the French Impressionists, or, 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 or they grow out of uh, the more delightful of Tintoretto, for instance. I see. They grow in, I think there's a profundity which, which goes on into, in, in, into experience, great experience. Can I just ask you briefly about more recent painters? I'd be interested to know what you feel about, for instance, the Expressionists, the German Expressionists, rather than the French ones. Yes. What do you feel about people like Nolder and Kokoschka? Well, Nolder is a very peculiar case in my, uh, my point of view, that I knew Nolder in black and white. And it was only probably in the last four or five years that I've seen Nolders in colour. And if I hadn't seen Munch beforehand, I could never have accepted Nolder's colour. Um, but they fascinate me from the point of view that colour can be used in a different way from structurally. I'm not particularly fond of Nolder, I'm much fond of Munch. Yes, I see. Um, and I, I think the interest is that, uh, that colour has an emotive power, and one tends to feel that emotions are undefined. The importance of these painters is that they have begun to define this range. I think uh, Van Gogh did so as well. Um, it's a use of colour as a sort of substance. Somehow between you and me, um, there's not just an abstract relationship, but a sort of substance, which can happen in music or can happen in, in, in colour. It's not structural. It's nothing like that. It's, it, it, it's um, a sort of personal relationship that goes on. It's something which is, which is vague to me. It's something I'm fascinated with because I did make a very, very strong attempt to understand the Expressionists when I was in Tel Aviv in the war. I had a good chance to do so there. Well, they have an, uh, quite a few of them, do yes, they? Yes, a, a lot of them are, uh, are actually um, refugees from Central Europe. Yes, I see. And uh, I saw a lot of it reproduction. I saw some originals there in Tel Aviv. And I did get a chance to see them. As you know, in England, we haven't had a chance yeah. to see them because there's been um, the conspiracy, and this is roughly the word, to keep expressionist painting out of England. Fair enough. What about the actual kind of humanist? quality you get in Expressionism, which I suppose really does tie up a bit with Rembrandt and Van Gogh and people. This very profound uh, human feeling, human contact, projection of human emotions and feelings and pity and compassion into the pictures. Does that, uh, does that interest you? Do you feel it's valid yes, sir, in Expressionism? I, I think it's valid. I mean, I uh, consist as a rationalization of it, but I think that the real frontier of uh, world history has been uh, say from Norway down through Poland into Hungary and uh, Romania and so on and through Germany um, this, this has been the important event in the late 19th and beginning of the 20th century um, that historical suffering has been brought to its sort of peak on this line and this painting has come out from it um, is the affirmation in our day of the same sort of value as that occurred in the Renaissance uh, when Christianity was begun to be made a uh, personal and um, an everyday event. Admittedly, it was sophisticated at that time. This is not sophisticated. This is human suffering uh, taken to the level of the, um, of the soldiers at the foot of the cross. Um, it very rarely aspires to the position of Christ himself. Well, that doesn't mean it isn't going to. Uh, the anger of Guernica, for instance, um, postulates no resurrection. Um, 
But on the other hand, in some of the things, like Two People Dancing by Monk, um, it does imply something of this sort, but probably through some personal relationship, a very intimate personal relationship. I'm very, I am a Christian, you see. I'm, <laughs> I'm very concerned with these things. Um, and I want to see how man, in, in, in his way today, is going to um, transcend his terrible physical oppression. And you feel that this is part of the approach of these expressions? Yes, I do. do. Yes, yes, I do, too. Hmm. I see. I'm not this person. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I don't say I'm an expressionist myself. I, I haven't uh, the depth of understanding um, to be able to do so, but it has fed me. I mean, I probably paint something very remote. I'm not as deep as this. What will happen to me later on, I don't know. I may be smug at the moment. <laughs> Yes, what do you think now about uh, the position of English art and uh, what I rather feel about the absence of uh, these dramatic and poignant and humanist elements in contemporary British art? Um, I don't agree that it's absent from, from British art. Uh, I think we must bring in Francis Bacon here, who I think is making a very courageous attempt um, to show man as he is, not necessarily in England, but uh, man's situation. Um, I think also one should include somebody who's very often forgotten these days, and that's um, Kenneth Armitage in sculpture. Uh, I know that there's a humour in the sculpture, but it is extremely human and does show, um, very often in a thin way, the position of people in their environment. Uh, this may seem rather abstract in a way from what we're talking about, but um, I would bring in Armitage here because let's be quite honest about it, uh, Chadwick is painting men from space, is painting remoteness, is not uh, uh, is sculpting men from space, is sculpting remoteness, he's constructing them out of, uh, out of metal and sound like this. Um, his images are similar to Armitage, but they haven't the same impulse. Uh, I think these two, Armitage and, and Bacon, are actually doing something important which has come out of, uh, out of expressionist movement uh, and I think they're doing it in England I can't agree for instance that Gruber in France or, or, or that uh, Bernard Buffet who one could laugh at um, are doing anything of this sort I believe that there are uh, young painters in France who, who are attempting it I think Giacometti is magnificent in this um, I must say that I rarely see it in the States there's one exception there of Joseph Glasgow not known over here at all and should be known, um, who is definitely uh, both painting and doing sculpture of the human situation. I hate to use the word the human situation, but we have to approach it first of all from the, the rather sort of abstracted, remote, administrative point of view. But the, yes? No, fair enough. I was only going to ask you um, what you then felt about the neglect of a man like Kokoschka, who had lived and worked over here in London for a time and who, at least while he was living here, was so neglected and kind of spat on by the authorities. Do you, do you feel strongly about this? I feel very strongly about Kokoschka. I think it's, um, it's disgraceful. I'm putting that mildly, um, on purpose, because I think it gives the sense of, of what most people think about the treatment of Kokoschka as disgraceful. I think it's far worse than this. I think it's part of a deliberate policy uh, to avoid the issue of expressionism. Um, I think it was deliberately engineered by a certain number of uh, abstract artists uh, who were concerned with their reputation and that they used commercial galleries to put forward a certain sort of art as being English art um, and forgot to notice what was amongst them. Uh, Lowry has survived because he had the sense to wear smart suits and a tall collar and not look like an artist. Uh, Kokoschka was wide open. I should imagine was an extremely uh, naked person and suffered a great deal uh, from what happened to him in England, uh, but I believe is not bitter from it. I mentioned, by the way, in connection with a, a humanist art, uh, Leger. Uh, he's not liked because of the apparently mechanistic quality of his, of his painting. I don't object to this because I think it's a transition. I think it's important. I'd also refer to Picasso. Uh, Picasso has had exactly the opposite from Kokoschka. Uh, he's had uh, 
a great sense of the showman in himself, and has been taken up by other people, and he has actually been the sort of standard of, um, of say, human painting in our time. I think, myself, that very few are going to last, but there are some marvellous things like a cat with a dead bird, uh, Guernica, um, Velas Meninas, uh, um, Velasquez's interpretation, which is in the Tate.